the Oklahoma Sooners got another one, the first commitment on the 1st of August. We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Sooners. Thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. He's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also listen to him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. Josh, the Oklahoma Sooners picked up another blue chip recruit, this time Colton Vasek, the Austin, Texas native committing to the Oklahoma Sooners. Yeah, right there out of Westlake High School. You mentioned it in Austin, Texas. We thought coming out of the weekend that was the party in the palace, we thought Vasek uh, probably going to pick Oklahoma just based on the crystal ball predictions that we saw come in from the 24-7 sports experts. Six and a half inch, 225 pound edge, four star uh, talent, according to 247 sports. Number 19. Edge player nationally, if you're looking at the 24-7 sports composite rankings, number 31, a little further back, if you're talking about just 24-7 sports' uh, individual rankings, he's still a four-star there. But either way, I mean, really anywhere you look for Colton Vasek, top 200 type talent, top 20, top 30 edge rush type talent, and one of the top 50 or 30 you know, type players in the state of Texas, which you start talking about that territory, John, obviously a very, very talented football player that Oklahoma gets a commitment from in Colton Vasek. And again, as I've made the remark in some of our past shows, John, the thing that just excites me so much is getting four-star defensive talent. I mean, we can get into obviously who they went out uh, over to earn this commitment. You, you look at Oregon, you look obviously at Texas. It's huge anytime you beat Texas in a recruiting battle. But, man, I just think big picture for Oklahoma, four-star defensive talent, and it seems like Oklahoma all of a sudden starting to attract that in droves. Yeah, this is a kid that had a host of Power 5 offers and the who's who in the SEC, including Alabama and Georgia. I mean, this is – this is a very highly regarded prospect in the 2023 recruiting cycle. I talked about it a little bit on the Monday show. I see a little bit of JJ Watt qualities in this kid, like six foot five, big, strong, long, athletic. He's got quickness. You watch him off the snap. He's got a great first step. He's got a great swim move that allows him to beat rushers inside. And then he's got good strength and, and uses his leverage well to beat you know, offensive tackles to the outside. One thing that I was very, very impressed by with his you know, huddle film or huddle highlight tape was his ability to set the edge in the run game. Like He's very disciplined as a run defender in that when he it's his responsibility to get to the edge, he's very good and very adept at holding up the offensive tackle, not letting him bounce outside and not letting the runner – get out to the outside as well, forcing him back inside where the rest of his defensive line process or defensive line is. So this is a very, very big commitment. And, you know, the, the second for Miguel Chavis in just the last couple of weeks. And this is a guy, um, Miguel Chavis. I mean, he was the only assistant coach position coach on this staff that didn't have any experience as a position coach. And he's knocked it out of the park so far with PJ Atabare and now Colton Vasek. It's huge, man. To be able to go into Austin and get this commitment, it, it I mean, it's how we felt when by Job committed to Michigan State. Like that's the same kind of feeling. Now, it's not our biggest rival doing it, like it is Oklahoma going into Austin to do this. But it, I think it just it resonates so big and so powerfully because this is the type of thing that Brent Venables and his defensive assistants are going to be able to do now for years to come because of his ex- his um, experience and his success both at Oklahoma and Clemson. We might, you know, undersell his time at Oklahoma a little bit because of the way certain games went, but let's be real. Like 
that was a very good defensive team that had really, really good defensive line talent. You think about the Gerald McCoys, the Dusty Dvorak's, the Tommy Harris's. I mean, there were there were a lot of really, really good players on those defensive fronts during his time at Oklahoma. And then that just continued when he got to Clemson. Now, I don't know if anybody expected him to get a class that has the potential to be a top five recruiting class, but he's he and his staff are recruiting, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Like this is going to end up with a top five recruiting class when it's all said and done on national signing day next year. No doubt. Yeah. They are certainly pushing into that type of territory with the, Commitment here of Vasic. You just look at what the overall team rankings look like. And Oklahoma, all of a sudden, they, they were number seven. Now they, they leapfrog in front of Clemson. They're number six, according to the 24-7 sports composite team rankings. So they are right there, knock, knock, knocking on the door of the top five of the recruiting rankings. You mentioned Miguel Chavis and his recruiting chops here. He was, sure, naturally questioned, okay, how well is he going to be able to, to do this for Oklahoma, being somebody that has only really served in that defensive analyst-type role before, has not been a full-time assistant coach coming over from the University of Clemson? Well, guess what? Brent Venables, uh, not only does he have an eye for talent in terms of players that he brings on to Oklahoma's campus and ultimately signs onto Oklahoma's roster – Brent Venables has an eye for defensive coordinator talent, for uh, defensive ends coach talent, which obviously Miguel Chavis, again, somebody that was questioned a little bit, how well are you going to be able to do this? And, you know, the rest of it, how does he coach on Saturdays? Okay, sure, it remains to be seen a little bit, but, man, I think we got a pretty good indication of how Miguel Chavis and Oklahoma is going to go just based on how the recruiting has gone at Oklahoma for Chavis so far. I don't just look at the Atabare and obviously this commitment here from Vasek. I go back to the 2022 signees, John, and think about R. Mason Thomas and think about Cavante Henry and think about Grayson Halton, those late decisions for Oklahoma that obviously Miguel Chavis was a big part in flipping those recruitments and ultimately winning some signings there for Oklahoma. So he's been terrific. He's been fantastic for Oklahoma. And, John, again, this is another – Huge win for Miguel Chavez. You know, one thing I also like about Vasek here, and by no means do I view this as just an end-all, be-all pre-rec, but I think when you can find it, it's something exciting, especially out of the state of Texas, a state that, you know, gets the type of credit a la a California or a Florida or Ohio, you name it. Texas is regarded as one of the ultimate hotbeds in the world of recruiting. When you're talking about somebody that's out of Westlake that's played at that type of level, John, at the, the high school level, again, like I said, I don't think it's a prereq per se. We see Oklahoma get plenty of talented kids that play 2A ball in, in Oklahoma or, you know, whatever, 3A, 4A, you name it, right, or from anywhere nationally that's not, quote, unquote, uh, District 26, 6A in the state of Texas. But that being said, for Vasek, when you're the defensive most valuable player of the state championship game in a win over Denton Geyer with three sacks, and oh by the well, oh, oh by the way, you helped Westlake to a perfect 16 and 0 record and that 6A state championship. Okay, I like that pedigree coming into the University of Oklahoma. You think Jackson Arnold's going to be uh, pretty excited to have him on his team now, and as opposed to having to face him uh, as a potential Texas Longhorn? <laughs> I would say, yes, he's happy to not have him chasing him around. And, hey, it can't be lost in translation here either, John. I mean, we talk about, hey, it's, you know, Westlake kid. You know, you, you win the battle over the University of Texas. His dad played defensive end at Texas in the early 90s. So Oklahoma wins this recruiting war here over Texas in a situation with Vasek to where he's a Longhorn legacy. That is massive news in a huge statement and feather in the cap for Venables, for Chavis, for everybody with Oklahoma, that they can go win that recruiting war. Yeah, it's huge. And it's it's going to continue to be the case that Brent Venables is going to go into these recruiting battles with these high-level you know, recruiting teams. Say what you want about Texas as a program in 2021, there's still a really good recruiting team. That's never really been the issue for Texas. Now putting it all together on the field, that's the issue. So to go into Austin, get a legacy, 
that's huge in Brent Venable's first year. That's, I mean, that's a huge feather in the cat. Like you star that one, you, he may not see it any differently than any other commitment, but that's gotta be one of those that at least Miguel Chavis, he's gotta, he's gotta pat himself on the back for that one. I, I, I'm going to give him the props, Miguel. Congratulations on getting that commitment to you to the Oklahoma Sooners and Colton Vasek. We're going to have several more commitments to talk about over the month of August. Anthony Evans later in the month, Makari Vickers as well later in the month. Uh, we haven't heard anything from Jacoby Johnson on when that's going to go down. Parker on Friday told us that could happen any minute. It'll be one of those surprises. David Hicks as well. We don't know when that one will come down, but a lot, I mean, they can add several more commitments to this class over the next you know month and then obviously until National Signing Day. So it's not even close to being done, and this can even get even better. It's crazy to think that. It is. And, you know, there were some that thought that, you know, this class, it, it might be dead and that, uh, you know, those those in Texas were pretty happy. Just sip our tea here. No big deal. This class, uh, obviously, Oklahoma, not dead on the recruiting trail. Those of you on the YouTube side obviously understood that on the podcast side. You may be wondering, OK, what's up with this like second of silence here? If you're watching on YouTube, go subscribe there. If you're not, and you'll understand what that's all about. But, hey, man, this is a great recruiting class. They've obviously been on a massive tear in Vasic. Just the latest example of that, my friend. Yeah, it's fun to watch this team just kind of putting this together in the last couple of months. I mean, if this is what every June, July is going to be like for the Oklahoma series, sign me up because June, July is generally pretty dead for content. So that's going to be great for us as content creators covering the Oklahoma Sooners. And coming up next, we're going to talk about the content that Pac-12 Commissioner George Klyavkov uh, had to, to provide for us at Pac-12 Media Days. Uh, we'll talk about that after we hear from a couple sponsors. Josh, Pac-12 Media Day came last week. At the same time, Big Ten Media Day came. And all of the, the questions there were, what's next for the Pac-12? Because... They just had their conference rated for USC, UCLA, and seems to be the conference that's the most likely to continue to purge teams. I mean, the Big 12 has been rumored to be going after the four corner states. We talked about that on the show in Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah. And hey, Oregon and Washington are still out there too. Two of the better brands, according to a Forbes list a few years back, they were still top 25 brands in the country. This isn't over for the Pac-12, and George Kalevkov, he seemed to feel pretty threatened by the Big 12's positioning for some of their schools. He did, and do you buy what he's saying, that the Pac-12's in a much better position in terms of its media rights negotiations than the Big 12, and that's why the, the Big 12 and your mark and everybody is coming after our league the way that they are is because we've got a heck of a lot more to offer. Or did you get the impression like, yeah, and I get that maybe we're a little bit guilty of this because, hey, we're we're local here. We're based in Big 12 country, at least historically. That's not going to be the case for us uh, once Oklahoma goes to the SEC. But, hey, we're from Big 12 country, right? So we do have a little bit of maybe that leaning to – kind of lean the direction of the, the Big 12. Did did Klyvkov come across as desperate for you, or does he have something here that, okay, well, of course your mark is trying to pick us off while we're a little bit down and defeated with USC and UCLA off to the Big 10? Because guess what? We're still more valuable than the Big 12 minus Oklahoma and Texas. Where do you fall in that? I mean, I can see where they're coming from in the value standpoint because i mean the west coast just has a it's just more populous like there's just way more people from washington oregon down to the californias than you'd see in the big 12 states other than texas like texas could hang their hat up there too but i mean iowa kansas oklahoma they're not very you know pop, highly populated states but you bring in cincinnati you bring in ucf like those are big markets on the media front. Like, and then you have TCU still in Fort Worth, the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Baylor is not far from that. You're bringing in Houston. That's a big major media market. And so I feel like it's kind of a push, even though they, even if you consider they have Oregon and Washington, I mean, I think it's pretty even. And the thing that to me gives the big 12, a bit of an edge is what else is happening on Saturdays in the fall in the big 12, except for football. Not much. And so every fan of each of those schools 
is going to be locked in and tuned in every single Saturday. You don't see half empty stadiums at Iowa State. You don't see empty stadiums at Waco. You don't see empty stadiums at TCU, unlike USC, UCLA in the Pac-12. So you might have some better markets, but I don't think you necessarily have a better product. And what are what are these you know these media companies looking for? They're looking for product. They're looking for fan bases that are going to get excited and tune in so that they can sell advertising. And that's really what it comes down to is who's going to tune in. And they might be able to say, yes, we do better in the raw ratings. But do they? Because you look at some of the ratings from last year and the Big 12, they did better than the Pac-12 in a lot of instances. And so like you look at even just like Oklahoma State's games, they've fared very, very well. You know, Oklahoma State versus Texas Tech, Oklahoma State versus Oklahoma. Obviously, Bedlam's huge, but I mean, and then I think it was like Oklahoma State and there was, I can't think of the other game that I was thinking of aside from the Big 12 championship game, but they fared really, really well in the ratings department. And so, yes, I'm a Big 12 fan. Even when Oklahoma leaves, I'll still be checking in on what the Big 12 is up to because when I was a high school kid, you know, college kid, not having a football interest, you know, football team to root for at the University of Texas Arlington, who... You know, they shuttered their football program in the late 80s. I watched just whatever Big 12 game was on in the in that day. And so, like, when I think when I think back to the Big 12 in the early 2000s, like, I'm thinking of Andre Gerard from Colorado pushing Nebraska Cornhuskers to the back of the end zone. You know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm watching Vince Young. You know, I'm thinking of, you know, that win down at Texas A&M, you know, putting on a show for the Aggies. Like, I, I still like Big 12 football, even though Oklahoma's going off. And so, and I think that's going to be true for a lot of, you know, even Oklahoma fans and Texas fans, like they may not tune into every single Big 12 game, but because it's going to be on in their in their media market, they'll watch. And so while the Pac-12 might have two of the better brands in Oregon and Washington, I don't necessarily think they have better markets because up and down the West Coast, it's not complete football hot bases like it is in the Big 12. You know, from Iowa on down to Houston, like it's football country. And that's what the media, you know, the media uh, companies are looking for. They're looking for people who are going to tune in. And I think the Big 12 is going to tune in. Well, and to your point right there, okay, well, San Diego and Oakland and San Francisco, the Bay Area is nice. That's a tasty media market. Portland, th- that's a tasty media market. Seattle, tasty media market. It's not as tasty of a media market in the Bay Area, though, when Stanford stinks and when Cal stinks. And even at times when some of these programs have been good, they're just not as rabid of fan bases as we see from, say, Baylor of late, as we see from, say, Oklahoma State of late. You know, not that Kansas State will rate in that department, but guess what? Kansas State fans are going to really, really support their team. Kansas Jayhawk fans, if they could ever be worth a rip at football – they would rate just as good as anybody out on the uh, Bay Area. Obviously, we know that that has been a long, long struggle for Kansas, dating back well over a decade to the end of the Mark Mangino era. But I get what you're saying. Like, hypothetically, what Clive Kopp is saying on paper is correct. Hey, they've got San Diego. They've got San Francisco still. They've got Oakland. They've got Portland. They've got Seattle. But, you know, outside of – just the LA market, which you had with UCLA and USC. If these teams aren't good, the ratings indicate that a lot of these fans aren't watching these teams play bad football out West. So I I get what he's saying. I get why he says, quote, just to put a little context on this, that's a constant stream of nonsense. Let's be very clear. No PAC 12 school is joining the big 12 in quote. You better hope not George Clive but As far as I'm concerned, I would still be on guard and on my heels a little bit that, yes, there is a package out there, John, that could convince an Oregon, a Washington, a Stanford, a Cal to leapfrog over. And who knows, maybe those border states that we've heard about too, the Arizona, Arizona states, Colorado, Utahs of the world to join the Big 12. I think there is a possibility that that could draw a little bit more money if you can uh, obviously attract those schools and get them to sign up. So Clive Kopp, I know that he's, he's fending off all charges from the big 12, but he sounds a little Bob, Bob Bowlesby in to me, the way that uh, he's a little bit hurt over the way all this has played out. And really, I guess I get it to some degree, 
John, he should be on guard. But, man, I don't know that you're in this great position where you're that much better off than the Big 12. So you can sit there and try and shoot your cannon over here at the flyover states. But, dude, I don't know if you're safe, and I don't know if this realignment thing is done yet. Yeah, his comments about, oh, it's it's good to hear that the Big 12 is open. We haven't decided if we're going to go shopping there yet. I mean, come on, man. Like, you are not pulling any Big 12 schools to the Pac-12. If you wanted to do that, your best shot was 10 years ago, and you didn't do it. You didn't pull it off then. You're not going to pull it off now. Oklahoma State's not going to the, to the Pac-12. Texas Tech's not going to the Pac-12. You're done. Like, if you can hold your conference together and out of San Diego State, by all means, UNLV, sure, go for it. But you're not coming after the Big 12. The Big 12 seems pretty happy with where they're at, but they're going to see if they can add some teams to uh, to get themselves into that super conference conversation down the road as well. Hey, we got some NIL news happening on the Oklahoma front. There's several collectives popping up and several opportunities for you to partner with them and partner with the players and help them get some uh, get some support as well. But we'll talk about that after I tell you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. Have you tried the Built Puffs yet? You are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Ready? Indulgent cookie dough. Covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course, they're covered in 100% chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs have only 160 calories and have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. Low sugary, low calorie, and high in protein. So go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order over at built.com using LOCKED15. Josh, we've got several NILs collectives for the Oklahoma Sooners popping up. The most recent one, I mean, we got several, we got one that's going to be coming here this week, and we but we had one pop up on Thursday or Friday of last week, the Norman NIL club established to help support 80 or more 80 plus Oklahoma Sooners football players uh, for those that are participating. And they have got a goal of $50,000 per month um, in support. And right now in just a few days of their launch, they've already reached $20,000 in, uh, in support. Locked on Sooners is a proud supporter of the Norman NIL club. Uh, but we've got even another one coming. You know, it's the Dusty Dvorak and Gabe Eichard Collective strengthening Oklahoma. So what do you make of all this? What's your takeaway from what's happening right now on the collective front? Well, it's the world we live in, in college football, to where you have to have these collectives. You, you got to have collectives that directly pay the players anymore. And I like the way that – I like the way that – Dusty and Gabe's collective set up. I like the way that the Norman NIL club is set up to where obviously you set up the monthly donation fee if you want. And Oh, by the way, you can, for $25, you can get that Theo Weiss uh, jersey, I believe it was at the Norman NIL club. So you're not totally getting um, at least nothing concrete that you can keep. You obviously, you always have that access and the ability to, to get digital content that you wouldn't get elsewhere and to be able to meet and greet with players at the University of Oklahoma and that message board access and all of that. But, hey, some people, they do kind of want the T-shirt as well. So you get that for $25. Again, ultimately, it's just the world, I think, that we live in now in college football. And we knew that Oklahoma, because of, well, in the case of, like, Dusty and Gabe, you've got alumni that really, really still care a lot about the University of Oklahoma and want to position the University of Oklahoma to where uh, obviously it can remain an attractive destination and remain one of the most successful places in college football. And uh, you have to have these things. And the Norman NIL Club, again, I, I like the way that it's set up to just directly get that money to players that are right here in Norman on the University of Oklahoma roster. Yeah, and so they've got a goal of fifty thousand a month. Um, they're well on their way. We haven't even reached the uh, August of or the the height of fall camp yet, and and the season is just around the corner. We're going to start seeing more of this kind of stuff pop up. Uh, I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable with the idea of you know paying players, but it just puts a little bit more in their pocket, helps them live live a little bit easier. They're not having to you know pick up part time jobs on the side, drive Uber or anything like that. They can just focus on their studies and focus on football. 
so if you're interested in that, you can go to normannilclub.com uh, and check that out. Uh, it, you know, it's really easy. You can get in there. And like Josh said, they've got a message board. They've got a chat room where you can interact. Uh, at some point, you'll be able to interact with players, but otherwise you can interact with fans that are also supporters of the club as well. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thank you so much for tuning in and checking out the show. Make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms. And you can check us out on YouTube as well. We're well on our way to 2,500 subscribers. We'd love to get there or even to 3,000 by the start of football season. So if you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you do that. Hit a like button and also that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. Catch you then. Boomer Sooner.